or especially like in Cooper Hall. Um, if you are at a concert or you know somewhere where you just don't have the room and you're kind of forced into that intimate space, it is usually reserved for people that you're very well acquainted with. Personal space is considered one and a half feet to four feet. And this typically serves for conversations, for family and friends. And so that's kind of the most common level of, you know, comfort. You have one and a half to four feet between yourself and the other person. And then social space is four feet to 12 feet, which would apply to most group interaction, including professional interaction. So in any kind of business setting, it's typically four to 12 feet. Um, I would also argue that's probably true in an academic setting as well. Um, maybe a little closer because maybe the rooms are small, but I think typically your social space would also include um, you know, any kind of academic situation. Now, public space, is not interpersonal. So public space would include everything beyond 12 feet and that is no longer interpersonal because that's just for everyone that happens to be you know, anywhere near you and it's not because you're interacting. So, and I actually have a personal story on this. Um, apparently I need a lot more personal space than some people and I wasn't particularly aware of this, but I'm standing in church and this was told to me by my husband so I have to take his word for it, but um, I'm standing in church and I'm in one of the pews and some, I don't even remember who I was speaking with, but somebody came up and knelt on the pew in front of me. So basically they were leaning up against the front of them was leaning up against the back of the pew in front of me. Okay. So, I mean, how much space is there in a pew? Like a foot and a half? I don't know. So, um, as this person comes up and gets pretty close to my face, um, I actually start leaning back because I guess I felt like I, they were invading my personal space. And I guess I didn't even really, I wasn't even aware that I was doing it. But Eric says from the side, my husband says from the side, he's looking at me, my knees are, the back of my knees are pushed up against the, the front of the pew behind me. And I'm arched back over the pew like from the side he said I looked like I was like bent on an angle and I don't even realize that I'm doing this but clearly they were invading my space and I needed more of it and he says that often if someone comes up and gets really close when they speak to me I back away and he says often they'll move closer and I back away and they move closer and he says I don't even realize that I'm trying to give myself more space. So clearly I have a personal need for <laughs> space. Um, but there are some people, and sp this is very cultural specific as well, because there are a lot of cultures where they are very, very close when they speak with you. Um, and that's very normal. You know, they'll even like be right up in your face when they communicate. And that is, you know, just part of the cultural norm. Um, and so, you know, that would be specific to person and to culture. Okay, and kind of on the similar um, line, but not exactly, um, when we think about territoriality, that is how animals, including humans, claim ownership of space. So we're talking about personal space on one hand, but then this kind of takes that a little further. We claim ownership of a space or an area. And so we will use territorial markers that show that the area has been claimed. So if you think about if you put a sweater on the chair next to you, that shows that that has been claimed if you want to save someone a seat. Or, you know, you put your stuff down on the table, that means that that seat has been taken. So territorial markers communicate that you have taken that space. Um, what are examples of markers that you may have used personally? What are some territorial markers that you use either in the past or consistently? And interestingly, you also use markers to indicate where your space stops. So you're not only using markers to say, this is mine, but then you also use markers to say, this is no longer mine. So I was curious if you all can think of specific examples of that. Um, how might you indicate where your space stops? Okay, so touch. If we talk about Touch can express intimacy, that makes sense. And remember, intimacy is not sexual, it's just a deep connection with someone. So we will use touch to express that. 
touching is vital to personal development and well-being, especially for infants. Um, there have been many, many studies that show that touch and um, personal development go hand in hand and that you know the infant's well-being is contingent on the amount of touch they receive from caregivers because it confirms value and love. And your tendencies to be a touchy-feely person or not are often based on your family experiences. So if you grew up in a very touch-friendly home, um, and that could be perceived incorrectly, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, if you grew up in a family that is affectionate and, you know, your parents held hands and they hugged and, you know, they kissed you and they were not afraid to show affection to you, you know, that will probably continue because the tendency is based on your family. Um, here's another personal example. I'm sharing a lot tonight. This is like self-disclosure night. Um, my family is very, actually my dad's side and my mom's side, both sides of my family um, are very affectionate. And we always hug each other when we see, first see each other, we hug each other when we leave. Uh, I mean, that's just the way that it has always been. Well, Eric grew up in a family where they never touched each other at all. And so it was very interesting because, um, and, and you know how you don't know something is not normal until you are exposed to the fact that it's not normal. In other words, like I just assumed that every family hugged each other every time they saw each other. Like I never had any frame of reference to show me otherwise. So when I met Eric's family for the first time, you know, I walk up and, you know, he says, this is my mom, this is my dad. And of course I hug them. And they didn't respond necessarily awkwardly. Um, so I didn't know the difference. I mean, they hugged me back and that was the end of it. And I found out later from Eric and from his parents that that revolutionized their world. Um, now they hug me and now that's a very normal part of our relationship as a family. But they said that until I came along, they never hugged, they never showed affection to each other. And because that was so normal for me, I just assumed that that would be normal for them. And so um, that was kind of a very interesting learning process for both of us because they were exposed to that it's okay to hug other people in your family. And I was exposed to, oh my gosh, there are people that don't hug each other every time. So very interesting. Um, we are more likely to touch people when we're feeling friendly or happy, which of course, you know, when you feel good, you often want to show other people that, you know, you're excited or you're happy and you touch their arm or you hug them or you do things like that. However, um, we are also more likely to touch other people when we want someone to do something for us. So remember that persuasive element. When we are sharing information rather than asking. So if we are disclosing something, we'll be more likely to touch other people. When we're trying to persuade someone. When we're talking... <clears throat> oh, sorry. When we're talking about intimate topics. So anything that's really deep or really significant or really... Um, you know, s specific to that other person, we will use touch. We will use touch more in social settings than in professional settings, which that makes sense. If we're ex excited to share good news, we will use touch. And if we're listening to troubles or a worried friend, we will use touch. So my question is, what are examples of when it is comfortable or appropriate to use touch? because again, that's very culturally specific. And again, it's situationally specific. Um, and it's kind of a personal thing. I mean, there are people that are just not affectionate people and there are people that are very affectionate. So what are examples of when it's comfortable for both people or appropriate for both people? So if you wanted to reflect on that, I'd be interested to read your thoughts. Okay, so now let's briefly talk about appearance because we can't talk about nonverbals without thinking about what we look like. There's the quote, presentation is everything. And so if we think about our appearance is the way that we present ourselves to the world, um, Americans think that attractive people are more credible, they're happier, they're more popular, they have more money, the list goes on and on and on. There have actually been studies that show attractive people get higher paid positions literally based on no other reason than their level of attractiveness. They get um, management jobs more often than people who are considered unattractive. Um, they are given 
priorities or given specialty things because they're attractive. So um, in our culture, we certainly value, you know, what people look like and how attractive we think that they are. Perception of attractiveness is contagious. And what I mean by that is you may not necessarily think that someone is attractive, but if you hear a lot of people talking about how attractive someone is, and that doesn't necessarily have exclusively to do with what they look like. Sometimes the perception of attractiveness is also because you find out more about the person and you hear so many good things about the person that you begin to find them attractive because of you know their qualities and their personality, etc. But perception of attractiveness is contagious. So the more you hear about how attractive someone is in any capacity, the more you tend to think that's true. Clothes are important. The clothes that you wear tell how you want to be treated. And on one hand, I think you could argue that's unfortunate because I don't think that that much credence should necessarily be put in your attire. However, the clothes that you wear do communicate what you expect of people. And so my question is, what do clothes tell you about a person? And I know that's going to be a very personal interpretation, and so I'm not asking for one specific answer. I'm just trying to get your thoughts. What do clothes tell you about a person? And what do you want others to know about you? And I say no in quotations because they don't really know you by what you wear, but you get what I mean. What do you want others to know about you based on your choice of clothes? So think about the clothes that you wear, and then what do you want others to know about you based on what you wear? And if what you want others to know about you and what others actually glean from your attire are different, that might be something that you consider as well. Okay, so if we're going to interpret nonverbal communication, there are three primary dimensions, and we're going to go through these in a little more detail. But there are immediacy, arousal, and dominance. So in immediacy, these are behaviors that communicate liking, which the easiest way to think of that is we move toward persons and things we like, we move away or avoid those that we dislike. I mean, that's pretty intuitive and self-explanatory. So things that we like, we're going to communicate that and our behaviors will draw us toward that and we avoid or we move away from things that we don't like. When someone expresses pleasant nonverbal messages toward us, we respond in a pleasant manner. So someone expresses something positive and we do the same. Immediacy is also contagious. So behaviors that communicate liking is immediacy. Immediacy looks like, because I, I mean, I know that seems a little vague, so I want you to have a little more concrete examples. We use these cues to show immediacy. Proximity, we're close, we lean forward. Our body orientation, we are either face to face with someone or we're side by side. Eye contact is mutual, we smile, we nod our head. We have open arms oriented to the other person. Our cultural and context appropriate touch. So, you know, obviously in certain cultures you're not going to touch them to show that you like them, but in our culture, often that is true. And your the pitch of your voice also indicates that you like someone. The higher your pitch or the more upward your pitch communicates that you like something or someone. So that is a kind of a specific list of what immediacy looks like because I know that the definition doesn't seem to make sense with the word, so I wanted to give you specifics. Okay, then arousal is the second component. The easiest thing to define that is it's an expression of interest and responsiveness. So if the nonverbal communication is passive and dull, we conclude that they are uninterested. Now, if we're shown interest and responsiveness, then we assume that they are interested. And so, you know, then the conversation continues. Now, Sometimes there are mixed messages, and the example that I have there is when you call someone and they're like, hello, 